dollar organization. The way you want to look at Honeywell is four businesses plus the fifth one. So I'll explain how, how you want to look at it. Aerospace, that's where you know, I'm most comfortable, so we're going to talk a lot about uh, aerospace. If you just want to get a one-liner as to what aerospace is, if in the Aero India show, all the planes that flew, every plane will have a Honeywell uh, avionics system, or a mechanical system, or an electrical system. So that's the way you want to understand what we do in aerospace. Home and building, Honeywell building technologies. So basically, with the way how you would like to look at Honeywell this building technologies. This call is being transcribed. Is that? This call is being recorded. Uh, just look at this uh, building, right? So in somewhere, I think actually the room behind, you have a center where there is some hardware, some software, and some analytics that looks at every device in the building, be it your cameras, be it your, uh, uh, you know, your heating, uh, cooling, uh, your uh, fire, all of that. You control the whole building with that Honeywell product. Now, is it just a building? No. You can do it with an airport. You could do it with a football field. So basically, that's the whole, uh, this, this business takes care of. So before that, out of the 35 billion, aerospace is about 11.8. All the others are similar, 8, 8, 5. That's how uh, you know it is spread. Aerospace is the place. Then we move on to performance materials and technology, right? So I think from a performance material technology, uh, you got to look at three things. One is materials. The other one is performance technology, and the third part is automation. So as an example, if you take an oil refinery, right? That is uh, where you refine crude. You will have what are known as catalysts. Those catalysts are made by Honeywell. In fact, we've been here, I think, 80 year, years ago, when, when first in India, you know, when the refineries were uh, set up. Because each crude will have, whichever crude oil you get, each crude will have a different catalyst. When you look at it from a process and automation, if you look at any refinery, a refinery cannot stop, right? It, is, it works 365 days. What does that do? What does the refinery do? Opens a valve, closes a valve there, you know, moves from one tank to the other. So you have a whole hardware system, you have software, this is all machine control. Uh, you know, these are the things which this, this group does. And finally, safety and uh, productivity solution. Safety, these uh, are products, example, uh, our own masks, which we had during COVID, right? Or what the firemen wear when they go to, uh, you know, uh, stamp out uh, fires, or even in any hazardous uh, kind of uh, scenario. Those are the safety products. Productivity solutions, you can imagine, let's say, something like a, a Walmart, right? You have storage of all different products. You would also maybe having products move on a conveyor, and you're supposed to read it very quickly, read the barcode, so all of those scanning, the mobility, all of that together is uh, this organization. So you, you have these four organizations, and then you have the fifth, which is the Honeywell Connected Enterprise. So what the Honeywell uh, Connected Enterprise does is, the output of all these products in terms of an operation technology, you couple it with uh, IT, right? And then you have value-added uh, uh, solutions to customers. These customers are in the same thing. So that <laughs> will give you a, a view of uh, uh, what we do. So I think now we'll go a little bit into aerospace. We can go to the next slide. Okay. Okay, before that, very quickly, Honeywell in, in India, as I mentioned, nine decades. I thought it was eight, it is nine. So <laughs> it's been a while. We have about 13,000 employees here over 5,500 engineers. And uh, if you look at it from uh, domestic sales and exports together, it's about a billion dollars. We have over 3,000 products and solutions. And then uh, if you look at it, uh, you know, we have one listed uh, 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 company here, which is Honeywell Automation India Limited, out of Pune. 
we have four technology development centers. So you're seeing the one here in Bangalore. So there's another campus up, uh, up there. So we have two campuses. We have one in Madurai and then one in Hyderabad. And I talked to you about the petroleum, the, the catalysts and all of that. That's in Kuruma. Uh, in addition, there are you know Honeywell offices in all the major uh, cities. And we also have uh, manufacturing centers, Burgaon, Baradun, and uh, Now, in addition to all what we do in terms of selling in, the, in India, in addition to what we do from an engineering point of view, there are uh, other set of people helping the globe from a back office uh, point of view. So these are the enterprise IT, you have the global finance center, you have the integrated supply chain, HR excellence, and the operations. So this is, in a nutshell, what we do in, in, in India. I think the key point you have to take away is that it's been a while, you know, it's been nine decades. And, and from an engineering point of view, so I said I am here for 25 years, right? There are people who are here for even more. I think in this, we will be celebrating our 30th year next year. So that's the uh, quick uh, summary. Okay, so maybe I'll touch about uh, from an innovations point of view, right? So what is at the heart of what Honeywell is, right? If you look at and say what are what is Honeywell? I think it's all about controls and automation. The controls you see in aerospace, the controls you saw in those uh, uh, plants, right? All of that is our heart. On that, we look at how we have we you know we we look at digital transformation so that we are able to connect people, businesses, reduce the, uh, you know, uh, have digital transformation. That's the, that's the part. And the third is the sustainability aspect. Now, from a sustainability point of view, a lot of things we do from a building's point of view, from an aerospace, in terms of, you know, some of our SAF, et cetera, all of that would be, a, and, and we have innovation in each of these. So that's a part of our DNA. So maybe we just go back for a minute. So the point is that all these years, a lot of innovation, most of the innovation is global, and a lot of that significant amount comes from this place. With that, I will move to what we do here. So this, we call ourselves Honeywell Technology Solutions. As I mentioned, we started off in 1994, and over the period of time, we expanded uh, you know, into China, into the Czech Republic, and into Mexico. We no longer, uh, you know, operate out of China for the last five years or so, but uh, we have technology centers in, in, uh, in the Czech Republic and also in Mexico. So what do we do here? I think we would like to call ourselves as the innovation engine of Honeywell. And over the period of time, we have design center uh, ownership. That is, we have the ownership of designing the products, which we do by meeting with customers, getting requirements, building the whole product, and shipping it out. So that is what we, we do here. We are also customer centric in the sense, in the past, when we started off, we never had an opportunity to meet with customers. But now, you know, uh, from an aerospace point of view, we have Airbus coming here, we have Gulfstream coming here, we have Dassault coming here. So we interact with them on, you know, as a part of the product development process. Third is the most important, I think my colleague will talk more about So in the last few years, we've had a lot of successes in, the, in India. So the regional aspect, the regional innovation aspect is pretty high. For example, if you look at it from an aerospace point of view, I, I think many of you may know, but HTT 40, uh, the trainer which uh, HA is building, the engine is a Honeywell engine. The whole program is going to be executed. It is being executed from this uh, office. It inc includes engineering, it includes supply chain, it includes manufacturing, it includes training. All of that, this team you know, is, is, is doing. Also, I'd like to touch upon a couple of other aspects. In terms of, you know, if uh, it's again very unique because if you take aerospace, you have the avionics part, 
which is hardware and software. Then you have the electrical part. You have the mechanical part, right? And you also have a little bit of chemical. Of course, from a BMT point of view, a lot of chemical. So you will see, uh, uh, you know, from an engineering point of view, all these disciplines here. And we also have the ability to leverage these skills across the businesses as well. Okay, we'll go to the next slide. So, very quickly, I think you're going to see the first lab, which is where, how, to basically, if you really want to make a product, you got to have real good labs. You got to really do all your testing, all your capabilities you'll have to do in-house. So we will see that lab, uh, you know, you'll get a better picture. The second one is, uh, again, we're going to see this lab as well. This is all our simulation uh, in, in aerospace. It also has simulation in the urban air mobility. I'll talk about that. The third one is in Gurgaon. So these are, uh, we call it the pilot UOP lab. I mentioned about different crude. You know, you want to uh, see how it works. So all of that you have to do there. The fourth is in Hyderabad. This is called the Flight Operations Center. So what happens is, globally, you have business jets flying, right? From Hyderabad, you can see where they are flying. You can communicate to each of these planes. Somebody may say, hey, I want to have a fuel uh, arranged in this airport, right? And so from here, the team will, will help. So that's in Hyderabad. I think we'll spend time in the first two labs. And maybe you can ask uh, more questions. OK, thank you. OK, so this is uh, from an aerospace point of view. So what I will do is I'll maybe make use of this airplane and then uh, try to segment the market uh, as well in the process. So as you see, this is a, a passenger jet, right? This is a plane which we fly. And this is a plane which is bought by airlines, right? And who, buy, uh, who sells it to the airlines? People like Boeing or Airbus. So what we do is we build products and deliver it to Airbus and Boeing who integrate it into this plane and then sell it to customers. So what do we do? So this is, uh, you know, right at the nose, this is a weather radar. What, what this can do is it can see 300 nautical miles away. And you look at clouds, so it will kind of look at it. It will color code it. If you have it as a dark red, or rather a pinkish red, it means there are clouds, right? And so the, they can take a, uh, a deviation. On the extreme back is called an auxiliary power unit. So this is avionics. This is a mechanical product. What it does is it, it, it generates electricity. You see all the lights in the plane. You see air conditioning coming. That's because this is a jet engine. You know, next time you go, you'll have a look. You will see the exhaust coming out from here. So this one will give you the power. Once they move the plane, they start the main engine. So this main engine for this plane is typically made by, say, GE or Rolls-Royce or Pratt & Whitney. Once they start the main engine, this guy gets disconnected. So that's why it's called an auxiliary power unit, because then after that, the main engine uh, takes over. So Honeywell makes a lot of things, both on narrow body and also on white body. And then you have all the other, uh, the whole of the lighting, all the exterior lighting, we do that. We also have uh, an entire environmental control system. So the heating and cooling inside, uh, that's done by Honeywell as well. So this is the, what, you call, what we call as the ATR segment, right? So now you make that plane smaller, eight seat, eight seater, right? It becomes a business jet. Who are the people who buy business jets? Well, the individuals. <laughs> it's, a, it's a different segment altogether. It's like, if this is a bus, that's like a sports car, very special. So there, so in the lab I will show you, we do the entire avionics. We also make engines. So while this, this entire uh, plane, you will see engines from GE, Pratt & Whitney Rolls, or the business jets, how do you make engines? So in this campus, apart from avionics, you can you also have engine technology. We have people, about 200, 300 people actually, working on this. Uh, so, so the way how Honeywell has uh, organized the businesses is all the electronics put together is called electronic solutions. 
all the engines related power is called engines and power systems, right? Honeywell makes the wheels and the brakes. We make uh, the ECS system as I mentioned. We also make all the motors and actuators to move all of this. All of that put together is called the mechanical systems and all, right? And you also want to send the data out because uh, once a plane lands, you want to pull out the data, you want to see which <coughs> product or which LRU, how is it functioning. All of that comes under services and connectivity. That is, you are pulling the data off the plane while you are flying and also when you, when you reach them. So that is, in a nutshell, the four uh, areas. This is a new one. It's called, you know, we, we call it as urban air mobility. This is something when you are able to see it in the lab as well. So the way you want to picturize this, fast forward about maybe six years from now. I don't know, I hope it happens in, in, in Bangalore, I'll be the happiest person. But very surely you will have a craft with uh, six people or five people getting off a building vertically. The engines move forward, it hovers, I mean it flies and then it lands. Everything will be through electric uh, propulsion. Basically something like a Tesla in the sky, right? So that is what is the fourth business area and that's where we are working a lot as well. I'll show you a few uh, you know, products in the lab. Okay, any questions so far? Uh, does uh, this lab cater to all the verticals of Honeywell or just aerospace lab? So, all the verticals, but I'm going to show you only aerospace. aerospace. I have no clue on, on the others, but this is this area, I think. I, one more question, uh, you know, if you, to lead. What are we doing here? Let's say on the UAM, is it cutting edge? Absolutely. Is there anybody else doing this for Honeywell globally? Yes, 50%, 50%. That's the kind of thing. And each one have our own uh, responsibilities. Any other questions? You said uh, you're making engines for the business jets. Uh, no, no, globally. Globally? Yes. We have, team in we have a team which will helps designing these engines. Okay, so 300 people, where are they? They are all based here. They are, they are, uh, I think there are about 50 in Hyderabad <laughs> and oh. 250 here. So how big is this team globally? About 1,800. Okay. And uh, like, is it a new thing you started or you've been doing it this? Well, this we have been doing it for, for, for I think maybe 20 years. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so I talk about what we are doing in, in future as well because there's a lot of new technologies which we are also working on in the same but area. Somewhere you mentioned that you, you don't operate out of China now. No, no, Honeywell is, yeah. but earlier when you say Honeywell Technology Solutions, the, the leader for Honeywell Technology Solutions is based out of India, who has operated, I mean, who looks at the teams, Honeywell teams in, in, in the Czech Republic, in, in Mexico, and earlier in uh, China as well. But now we no longer do with China. It's about five years ago. You know, but otherwise you are in Yeah, Honeywell is very much in China. How many about people in your aerospace business? How many people work in your aerospace business? So I'll, I'll make it. So we are about 3,000 people. In Bangalore? In Bangalore. Around in India. India. Okay. In that 3,000 people, about 2,200 work in engineering. Okay. We have a set of people working in what we call as customer and product support. Right? We also have people working in ISC, Integrated Supply uh, Chain. And we have a few people working in the, in the marketing side as well. Commercial. So this business uh, jets, you make engines for business jets, right? So your customers would be who? Bombardier. Gulfstream. Bombardier. Gulfstream. Bombardier. Bombardier. Not Honda or no? Uh, no. No, not Honda. I mean, actually, you know, it's in the same category, uh, but I, I would say business jet Bombardier is, Bombardier the, is the right Bombardier. example. I think Ambani has a Bombardier, so. <laughs> so, <laughs> maybe, so they, we have, it's called, uh, I mean, we have several engines, the HTF 7000. Is, is the uh, you know is the flagship, and so perhaps it is there. It is there on Mumbai, so Mumbai has it. 
No, in India we are about 6,500. Okay. What is this 13,000? Yeah, 13,000 is the full count of all employees within all employees. India. So in India the total Honeywell employees are 13,000. Which engineers are 6, probably engineers are 6,000. Okay. I always had this doubt, you know, mm -hmm. now, earlier also. You know, globally you are a very big company. And in India also you are very well diversified. You are into everything like you mentioned. And you know, you're like a, you know, it's everywhere. But your revenue is just still 1 billion, which is hardly oh, any. from um, our revenue That's is 30. Include, including your domestic and export. Why is that not? So, so let me put it this way. See, all the work what we do, we, do, we work on APOs, right? We work on, so uh, what we exclude, like for example, let's say uh, Indigo or Air India buys a few planes. It comes with an APO. That is a Honeywell APO. But we do not take the credit for the sales of what has happened on the plane here in India. That's considered as a global sale. So when we say 1 billion, it is like what we have sold to people like HAM, plus all the work what we do together. So that's the only thing, that's the work, that's Your the business. Your contribution to the global business would be much, much more than this Absolutely. Company. So if you look at the value that we are generating is not just 1 billion. Mm -hmm. It's much more than that because, uh, you know, we were also doing some estimates of the, I mean, I can't give you that figure, but it's like... Uh, you know, the, the size of 13,500, a majority, a large majority of that are actually working for global, to support the global teams. And uh, the, this uh, business, uh, the numbers were actually looking at the India revenue number is a very small number. But if that so, includes your exports also, right? No, the exports so, are there, but largely it's a lot of other, like you have, so I'll give you an example, marketing. Global marketing, we don't have anybody as corporate marketing here in, uh, in India supporting the India business. But we have marketers who are like 100 marketing people, 111 or 12 marketing team members sitting somewhere in Honeywell, but they're all supporting so, global marketing. So let me give you another example. So let us say a product is made, right? Or let us say 50% of all the engineering is done from here. That product could be getting billions. Yeah. We don't count that, I mean, in the sense it's a part of the global... Uh, yeah. So those revenues are not counted. Then we don't yeah. count those. Okay, so very briefly, I mean, I said what, uh, from, a, from a team point of view, so from an engineering point of view, out of the 3,000, we have 2,100, we have about 200, we have about 100, and we have, I think, about 25 people. That's how we, we kind of uh, look at it. Uh, from, from an engineering point of view, what we do here. And as I explained earlier, electronic solutions, mechanical, engines and power systems, services and connected, right? So if you go to the next slide, I'll explain how this maps out. So over the years, what has happened, when you look at avionics, you look at engines, you look at mechanical, you look at hardware engineering, and you look at the, you know, the disciplines, system engineering, design and development, test, life cycle management, quality and certification. We put tick marks everywhere. It's complete end to end over the period of the last 29 years, 30 years. So if you if you look at it, uh, you know, uh, okay, what do I, how do I, I'll just, I mean, and probably you can look at it, you know, every year we have 100 patients coming out just from here, right, in aerospace. The way you want to look at us is, out of the 2,100 people, uh, about 600 people will have 17 years and above experience. That's the kind of thing. The folks who are working here are purely aerospace, you know, oriented, passionate uh, individuals. And we have spent our lives basically on each of these uh, these products. So that would give you the, the Unless you do that, you really can't be playing in, the, in a global kind. So they, we will see all these labs. I mean, there are a few labs in the other building. So we're going to see four labs, right? Four. four. So we will go and see the all of these four labs. So I, I will not uh, talk much about that. If we go to the next slide. Okay. So any questions before I hand it over to my colleague? In 
the drawn space what exactly you do? Yeah. So the question is what do we do in the UAM space? So when we say urban air mobility, it means you have a craft in which people are there. So that is why it becomes very close to what we are doing from an aerospace point of view. If you remove people, then you would have, say, uh, if you want to use it for uh, carrying uh, goods or you know uh, uh, packages, then it is in a different uh, kind of uh, link because you, you, you do not have the people aspect. So on the people aspect, on the UAM side, we do the entire avionics. We do uh, the what we call as the um, you know vapor cycle control equipment, which is basically the air conditioning for for the craft. We also do uh, you know electric motors and uh, a lot of other navigation kind of. Uh, so that's what, that's one. On the, we do the same thing on the uh, you know on the services or other the cargo kind of uh, crafts as well. Plus we also are doing a few things in terms of. Uh, you know, uh, especially now in India, we are trying to focus on this market where we do specific navigation kind of equipment, including anti GPS jamming, all those. Any unique um, capabilities here which either exist in limited amounts abroad, like any of the labs are only here in Bangalore? So, what is unique to your facility here? Several. So like for example, uh, if you take uh, flight management systems, right? Uh, I would say a predominant, uh, you know, globally, who has to do flight management systems? It would be here because it all got consolidated over a period of time. Similarly, radar. I mean, a lot of uh, capability in uh, in radar. Uh, that's in high throughout. I have two two such examples. You said you have 35 pilots working. So, what do they do? Okay, so that's a good question. What do you, you know, 35 pilots, what, are, what do they do? So these are people like, like all of us, right? So what we say is when you are working on avionics, when you are wanting to look at that, you should know how to fly. So we every year we sponsor about 10 people to go through this uh, pilot uh, training. So they, in, uh, you know, they, right now I think there are about 11 of them in Mysore. So they are undergoing the whole training. They will learn to fly. They will do one solo flight, and after that, uh, you know, uh, they, they come back and then start working. Very few of them take this into a real profession, but the idea is to give an orientation of what flight is, how do you fly, the language, what pilots speak, listening to the uh, ATC, uh, you know, all of those things they get, uh, and they come and teach the next uh, set of people because then it makes it easier for us to. Uh, work on these problems. Is that limited to any particular discipline or anybody in aerospace? Anybody in aerospace. Advice? Anybody in aerospace, they go through a process. We have an internal process. They are, they do write some DGCA exams they have to pass. And then they will be. What type of certification would you like? DGCA will give you a. It's called PPL. Ha, private, no, private, private license. Private license. It's not commercial. Mm -hmm. It's called PPL. Private, pri uh, private pilot license. So it's for mostly these turboprop for yes. small aircraft. Yes. We have been doing this for I think about uh, 12 years. For 12, 12 to 15, uh, last 12, I mean, I think 15 years. 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, you know, that's how the. Yeah. Some of them are gone as well. <laughs> right now we are 35. So somebody can come join you for this course? Or, uh, no, it's our employees. Employees, employees alone. We uh, open up the, uh, you know, the nominations in the beginning of the year. People apply. So they what do they fly? They have like maybe a Cessna, Karen, whichever training the plane uh, they, they have. They, Mysore is where we are, where we are flying. I think they did that in uh, Hyderabad as well a few years ago. And I remember when we started, we used to send them all to uh, in the US in Phoenix. But now, it's, now that we have everything here, uh, you know, that's what we're doing. If they if they selected, but they don't make the cut in the end, he doesn't get or he, he or she doesn't get his PPL. Any action against them, or it's okay. It's a, I mean, it's a big deal. See, they are doing this over and above the, yeah, the work, right? I mean, it's, a, it's actually, they're spending their weekends, they will take a one week off, you know. It's a big deal, so, nice. And is it voluntary or you only decide who from which team? No, no. We, what we do is, 
every team has a representation right mechanical guys you got you know electronics and all of but then it is more in terms of a process and obviously they should have that engineering acumen also to kind of I mean, yes. most of the people have the engineering yeah. acumen it is that uh, there are so many uh, processes and procedures and details one has to read yes. and like a pilot right yes. so that is a little taxing yes. uh, but the person people who really have the passion You've been doing this for what over a decade now. Years, right? yes. I haven't heard any other company I've been to yeah. in Bangalore in the aerospace. It's fairly expensive as well. I think it costs fifty, sixty L to get a PPL. Yeah. Have you seen been able to track the value you got out of this? By so and what what have you? So seen? so again, when you go to the lab, you will see. I'll give you an example. We are working on the UAM. One of the uh, what do you call uh, customers is called uh, Lilium. So hmm. we do it for Lilium, right? You can imagine our engineers sitting here talking to the Lilium engineers in the same language and in the manner of how their cockpit should look. Based on that, we design this. Now, only when you know all of this at the systems level can you even participate in this. In the past, what used to happen? It was somebody else doing in the world. Today, we are on the same table. Yes. So the, uh, that's a very good. Uh, so I, I make it a point, you know, in that uh, whole uh, PPL, uh, we need to have a. Uh, ribbon. I, in fact, I think we in this batch we have two out of the ten. How many so far have gone to this program over the years? The PPL. Yeah. I think there would be around uh, 50, 50, 55. In, in last 12 to 15 years that you mentioned. See, we started off with small because, to your point, it is expensive, yeah. right? So, <laughs> so we started off small, but la la this year I've been we've been able to afford about ten people. Yes. Now, in addition to this, there's one more training. These are called for drone training, and I'll actually need your help because the what we are doing is, you see, the uh, when you fly a drone, you need to have a license. if you actually look at it, you know, as a we've been very good in doing simulations. We've never done the actual practical testing. So taking that into picture <coughs> in Madurai, so we say all of this is called a red zone. So you and I, we cannot fly a drone here. Madurai is a green zone. So there we have a huge outdoor lab we are building. Now what we intend to do is those people working on the UAM sector in the next few years actually take their uh, simulation, their software, whatever they are doing, go to Madurai, sit in our lab there and actually fly. So you, you can imagine uh, uh, what you call a football field size area with uh, 80 feet poles and a net on top so that you know you, it doesn't go off. And then you, you do all your uh, experiments. So hopefully, uh, you know, I, I think the inauguration we have we have, we have hope. So this is being constructed. I think we'll have. Uh, hopefully, we'll get what all the media. Uh, you would be uh, maybe about 200. Uh, okay, uh, half a, half the size of a football field is what. So I think we will be, you know, calling the media and things like that. That's only for the drone. Yeah, it's for. And what we intend to do is not just for us. In fact, we already tied up with the local uh, colleges. What we are doing is asking them to have this in their uh, curriculum, so that the students can come. Uh, they do the theory class in you know uh, in the in the college, and then they can come and actually fly. And then maybe we, you know, it is for us it is good that we can hire a few, but we can't hire more all of them. But at least we are sharing the infrastructure with the environment where people can come and do. We also down the line want to do something like you know have competitions, have different colleges come. That way it will kick off this whole boom where you are beyond uh, sitting behind a desk but actually practically uh, doing this. For this roadmap that you are doing, uh, we also tying up to startups in this case. So we are not tying up with startups but what we are doing is we want to collaborate with startups. If they want to come and test their algorithms, you know, they can come and uh, use the space. That's, that's what. So typically what are these algorithms? Let us say you have a drone. Right, it goes up. You want it to see uh, a marker, like a similar to your QR code. Looking at that through a lidar or something, it has to sense and come and land. 
Now you can do that entire thing in software and you can simulate it. But the fun is when you go and put it in the in the craft, take it up, may see how it uh, do do all. Uh, I mean, and then uh, the other thing is uh, formation, swarm formation, all of that. We can we can actually do all of that. So it's not necessarily for your staffers alone. It's basically ba like I, I would say basically it is for us. But we want to have this opened up because more and more people get into it. As a country, also, you know, we we get that uh, capability. So, if you see in the past, right, things like robotics, we we are not there. Hardware, we are not there because we never had the the what you call the infrastructure for that. So, hopefully, this will help. Uh, you know, and if if it becomes a success, I'm sure others will also take up. The Poseidon, and then there is the uh, Netra, which is basically something called eye in the sky. So 200, 200 kilometers uh, far away, one airplane takes off. The radar basically spots it right then and uh, alerts you. All of these on the left side are coming coming with heavy audio equipment already. So there's a, there's a strong presence of the equipment with our forces, armed forces, air force, and army, and navy already. On the right side are the platforms that India builds through HAL. So you have the, the Dorniers, they build at HAL Kanpur, the HQD-14 engine just spoke, getting built in uh, HAL Bangalore. You have Tejas built in Bangalore again, or Group is a helicopter that's done in helicopter division, all of this. In all of this, if you see our equipment, there are certain ones that are marked in blue. These are technologies that we have localized in India. These are done in India. So this is made in India, in a sense, you know, long before, I mean, making in India long before making in India. Because the engines, for example, the military engines are built at HA. They don't go to us anymore. They're built at HA, they're maintained at HA, they're repaired at HA. We don't, we don't touch them anymore. This has been done since 1983. 300 engines are now flying. And with HQD-40, around another 88, 100 engines, we will have almost 500 engines flying, turboprop engines flying in India, made by India, HA, all together. The environment control systems, these are mechanical systems that basically keep the environment inside the aircraft similar to atmospheric environment at sea level. So these are made at HA in Bangalore itself, they are made at HA in Lucknow. All, all of them are essentially made, repaired, uh, their workshop is at HL. So this is this this whole slide essentially talks about two things. One is the heavy equipment participation that we have already in the armed forces, and the second, just because we have the equipment, doesn't mean we are kind of letting it go. We are continuously pulling that equipment into the Indian ecosystem. Because uh, just imagine today we have a lot of uh, we have a lot of uh, information in the paper about the G engine deal nowadays. This engine, this was a military transport engine, but it was done in 83. So an American company convincing the American government to open up the engine manufacturing to an Indian company back 40 years ago was a Herculean task. I mean, something, whoever sat on both sides of the table at that point in time has actually achieved literally the impossible. Because 83, you can understand, the dynamics was far different than what it is in 2023 right now. Similarly, once we had that, the Precedence allowed us to do other other equipment as well. There are a whole lot of other uh, you know opportunities or pursuits that we are engaged with the Minister of Defence, which I think you will come to know as and when it reaches some sort of maturity. But each of those steps have a strong component of making in India. We do not want to take back things to the US if we have a partner with due capability already hosted here. If the capability is presently not there, then that's a bit that's a bit of a partnership uh, discussion as to who can improve, etc. If you go to the next step, so all of these categories, we are essentially working uh, where we have a making India aspect. The fighters, a whole lot of equipment will go in, which will be made at HAL as well as other partners. You know, the multi-role aircraft has things that are already built in HAL right now. The UAV ones have our equipment that we are discussing with, you know, local partnership that can come up. Helicopters have our equipment built at HAL, uh, various divisions at HAL. 
the missiles in space have certain equipment where we have an agreement, co-production agreement with the Tata's, the Tata Advanced Systems Limited. The advanced tech is something that we are working on. As of now, I think the focus is on insertion of the technology and then subsequently there will be part time. Because this is really cutting edge. So at this point, we first have to have the equipment function effectively on the platform. Manufacturing and co-production and all of that is secondary. But bearing the extreme right, the entire thing on the left has a strong make in India for it. So I think while, while Niranjan spoke on the make from a, the India contribution from an engineering design uh, you know, development standpoint, this is the making the, the India component from both manufacturing, production, and operation standpoint.